you go to college and you went to college 10 years ago, who cares? Whatever that curriculum was, I don't care what, mm-hmm. what line of professional uh, profession you're in, probably 60% of the material you were taught is, is irrelevant today. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today's guest is Marty Strong. He's an author. He's uh, a a Navy SEAL. He's a business owner, all kinds of things. And he is giving some practical advice on managing through chaos, understanding how to implement change, all of those types of things. Really great stuff. We've got a lot of information, a lot of notes that I've taken, and I think some good takeaways that you will get as well. So get ready for this conversation. But before that happens, I do want to invite you to subscribe if you have not already. Uh, Whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on, make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you like this in video version, you can check us out on YouTube and Facebook, and you can subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. We have a brand new one that comes out every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. You can find out all that information by visiting lockdoc.net slash podcast. Now grab a cup of coffee and get ready for this conversation. We got so much to say, we got a podcast to make, we're sipping on lattes, and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh yeah. Marty, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Are you a coffee drinker by chance? I am, Chad, all the time, all day long. Well, cheers, I think. (laughs) Uh I am on my uh, probably fifth cup of coffee today, so I'm 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 kind of wired at the moment. But let's jump into it. Icebreaker uh, questions or rapid fire questions for you. Five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with unknown point values. Are you ready? I am. Question number one: What is your opinion on naps? Valuable if you can get them, yeah. and yeah, productive and valuable if you have the time to, to lock them down. I've I've always struggled. Like, uh, if you, you heard of Michael Hyatt? No. Michael Hyatt is he to, he talks about focusing on time and all kinds of stuff. But one of the things he talks about is these power naps throughout the day. And I'm like, I cannot rest my mind in the middle of the day to take a power nap. I've I just don't know that that could be the thing. The only time I can get a nap is if I don't drink enough coffee on a Sunday. But I, I'm very I'm very familiar with the uh, the power napper concept and philosophy that a lot of people try to follow. Yeah. Yeah, eh, maybe one day. I don't know. Question number two: Where's the next place you want to visit? Uh, Tahiti. Tahiti. Do you have plans to go there? Or you just that's that would be a fun place to go. I had plans to go to Fiji, and my one of my daughters went to Fiji a week ago. She lives in Sydney, Australia, mm-hmm. and so now I've seen lots of pictures of Fiji. So now I think I'm going to shift to Tahiti. <laughs> it's still an unknown. I've been to fo- over forty something countries in my life, and Lots of tropical places. Lived in Hawaii as a teenager, so there's not a whole lot of places that I haven't been, but Tahiti's one of them. Cool. I like it. Question number three, do you have any unusual fears? I have a fear of not contributing anything of value. All right. That's pretty deep. Yeah, well... (laughs) I spend all day trying to contribute something of value, either in my own uh, personal world, my family, or or my business. Yeah, well, that would that, I could see that would be a fear if you weren't going to hit that. Uh, let's see your question number four. What do you consider the most difficult food to eat? Uh man. So it's rapid fire, right? I, I for me. It's probably anchovies. Okay. Yeah. Don't like them. Can, can't even tolerate them on a pizza. Yeah. It, and if I had to eat them, it would, it, it would be really difficult. I mean, I would, yeah, that would be like a, to me, it'd be like a man test of some sort. I, I, I just don't like them. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm going to agree with you on that. Anchovies would be, yeah. The, the other one, and I'm, is artichoke. Uh, my family enjoys eating artichoke and it annoys me to the point because it's a lot of work for little food, like peeling these leaves off and all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, what's the point? Anyways, uh, sorry, end, end rant. Uh, question number five, what activity do you 
do where your mind wanders in thought the most? Let me ask that question again. What activity do you do where your mind wanders in thought the most? I would say run. Okay. Really? Yeah, I... I Just bounces I from thing like, to thing? I do not like to, to run. And when I do run, I don't like to think about <laughs> running. So I let my mind kind of wander and just skip channels and go wherever, wherever it wants to go. Sometimes I get some pretty good insights just for that reason. But yeah. I don't try to accomplish anything. I let my mind just kind of set free. Mm. I, I, I struggle like in reading. My mind wanders a lot. I'll, I'll be reading the, the words on the page, but then I'm thinking about something else. Audio books for me work a lot better. Uh, and, and even such, audiobooks while running, when I used to run, uh, was, was great because you could kind of put all those things together, but it was more focused, and it was a good distraction from running because, agreed, who really likes to run? Uh, all right, cool. Well, congratulations. You've passed Rapid Fire 5 randomly selected questions. We'll give you a score of 634. Out of a possible what? <laughs> yeah. 10,000? <000. laughs> <laughs> Sure, that sounds that sounds good. Well, Marty, thank you for being here today. Um, glad to to meet with you and chat with you. We're going to talk about a couple of different things. You've got a book out right now called "Be Nimble." Um, but before we kind of jump into some of those types of things, I want to kind of get an understanding as to, to who you are and and why you wrote a book. Because that's really I've always been enamored with people that can sit down and write a book or put a put a book together. And so even that, what. What were the experiences that kind of brought you to putting a book together? Well, I've, I've had a lot of experience teaching, both in the military. Well, in the SEAL teams, everybody teaches everybody else. And teaching and training your, your team as a leader is a responsibility. And as a follower, it's a responsibility to train your leaders and your peers and yourself. So you end up with a lot of podium time. I was a master training specialist which is a designation in the Navy for being able to being qualified to write full blown Navy curriculum for, for any course in the Navy. So I had a lot of structural uh, experience, training, background, credentials, et cetera. So you, you fast forward to about, I guess it was the middle of 19. And I started thinking about, you know, I was mentoring and coaching a lot of people and helping uh, some small business owners and I found that I was saying a lot of the same things to different people in slightly different situations and in industries over and over again. And I thought, well, you know, I've actually got a little bit of a of a mantra here, you know, a series of, you know, what to do, what not to do. And so I wrote some of it down and said, so what can I do with this? And eventually I decided that I was going to write an article. And then the idea of the article kind of grew into why not a book? And so I took about two months to try to figure out what I wanted to do as, as an end goal for the book. Mm -hmm. You know, did I want it to, to inspire? Did I want it to motivate? Did I want it to educate? Did I want it to be technical? Uh, did I want it to have lots of tips and tools? You know, all those kinds of things. And once I figured out what I wanted, which was essentially for the reader to experience what it would be like to go through a mentoring session on each of the topics that I address in the book, more conversational in nature and less textbook and less academic because I like books like that. I like Malcolm Gladwell. I like, I like books that, that teach through metaphors and through analogies and, and sometimes through parables. And it's, it's an uncomfortable way to learn. And if the insights are, are solid, then it's a great, a great way to impress upon people, whatever your insights are. It doesn't just fly over the top of their head because it's boring to read. So that's what I decided to do. That's why I decided to do it. And be nimble is essentially the, is codifying a lot of those lessons I'd learned and that I was passing on to people kind of randomly over a period of years. It's, uh, I like that concept, you know, with especially once you have a lot of experience, and we're going to kind of talk through some of that here mo momentarily, but you have that experience and then you start to kind of piece what has worked. And, and especially when you've been able to talk with other businesses, you can kind of start to see some trends there and be able to put that in a book. It's, it's awesome. I've always admired people that can sit down and put their thoughts into books. Just to kind of play a little bit on the, the question side, there are so many business books out there right now. What is, what is one thing that you have kind of seen that yours 
opens up people's eyes in a little different way than your traditional, you know, uh, your traditional business book that says you need to have people, processes, and products to to be able to make something work. So I, I kind of took it, I took a different angle. Um, you know, in IT website development, et cetera, everybody talks about user experience, right? Mm-hmm. So what kind of experience did I want to have the reader go through? And I was kind of targeting aspiring readers, excuse me, aspiring leaders and current leaders. And most most aspiring leaders and, and current leaders are challenged. So one, I had to look at what kind of challenges I think I would put at the front of the list mm-hmm. that had the most value in discussing. Um, second, you know, what, what's the mindset of somebody who's being challenged? You know, are they terrified? Or are they just, you know, fearful of failure? Or are they just kind of in general looking for an edge or just a little bit, you know, of an improvement? So I went through that a little bit and I thought, you know, people are pretty much either optimizing their, their behaviors as leaders all the time, mm-hmm. or they're in some kind of trouble and they're trying to figure out a way out. So mm-hmm. I addressed a little bit of both of those angles of attack with, with being nimble. So you, um, uh, you first you have to start off envisioning the reader, envisioning that target profile. And as I said earlier, I wanted the book to be read and to be used as a, a collection of tools and tips, techniques, um, some philosophy, mm-hmm. and also a very clear understanding of those things that did convey from my experience as a special operations officer that can be applied in commercial enterprises and you know profits and nonprofits by leaders yeah. to, su- to succeed and deal with challenges. And so I think I wrapped all that up in there from the feedback I've been getting from the book. I, I, and I used beta readers. There were other CEOs, executives, as I was writing the book to make sure I stayed true to that format, to sure. that end goal. And I think, I think from what the response is, um, it hit the mark. I recall, and, and that, I, that's a very intriguing um, direction, especially from a, from an audience perspective. I recall years ago when I picked up my first book to start learning about leadership, I was in the mode of, I feel like I'm a bit overwhelmed. I feel like I'm kind of hitting some dead ends. I feel like I'm frustrated because things are not working exactly like I want them to type thing, you know? Um, and the first book that I picked up uh, that, that started to open my eyes up a little bit differently on the kind of whole concept of leadership was a book called Turn the Ship Around by David Marquet. Um, and it was very much a lot of what you're just talking about is um, it's a kind of an aspiring leader and also kind of frustrated with the current process. What do I need to do to change some things? Uh, you talk a lot, um, in, you know, through – uh, through your concepts here about kind of leading through chaos and um, going through that process. I just from a perspective, uh, defining chaos, because I think the world has been in chaos over the last couple of years. Um, and there's a lot of those types of things. But I think that, it, and, and this is me, I guess, asking a question, your business could be in chaos regardless of what's happening externally in the world just because you've maxed out your uh, your processes, you've maxed out your uh, your leadership skills or kind of the ability to take it to the next level. When you talk about leading through chaos, are you specifically talking through external chaos or are you talking through uh, – or could it be applicable to both? Both. <clears throat> in the case of internal chaos – or crises, as perceived by the the organization, the members of the organization, you might have been the person that started it. <laughs> if you, and I, I consulted with a company a while back, if you walk into a room of senior managers and say, we're going to double the gross revenue of our company in the next 24 months. Mm-hmm. Now, what you've just done is you've thrown a gauntlet down and and there'll be a couple people in the room that perceive it as a challenge and maybe even get excited about it. Like it's about time. There'll be a couple that are kind of neutral. And then there'll be a couple that say, Oh hell, what's going to happen to me? I don't know if I can do this. And so you get lots of different reactions and then you say, go execute. That's the strategy for the next 24 months. And there'll be more, more information provided, but you know, with targeted goals and metrics, et cetera, new KPIs, whatever. But what you've just done is you've just taken a, you know, a perfectly 
you know, stagnant, settled, comfortable place, and you've thrown a grenade into the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And you own that, right? Now, you may not have done it. Maybe your board of directors told you to do it. Maybe, you know, there's some other reason for doing it. But, you know, when you have to reinvent yourself as a business because it's the right thing to do strategically as a business, that's usually an internal process. If you have to reinvent yourself as a business because something happened to you externally, like the competition changed the game, mm. changed the rules, changed the quality standards, uh, you know, the market, you know, janked left and your company's angling right, you realize, you know, it's kind of like the analog digital, you know, sometimes the comparisons aren't as clear and macro as that. Sure. So maybe it's more subtle, but the when if you find suddenly that that's happened to you, you've got to reinvent yourself. You've got to figure out a way how to correct, you know, as you said, turn the ship around, turn the ship to a new course and heading, set up a new strategy, a new operations plan to, imp to implement and execute that strategy. And you have to do it for, these days. You have to do it fairly quickly. I mean, back in the 80s and 90s, if you read books, there was very little on, you know, there was nothing about rapid prototyping. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you built the thing until it was perfect, and then you put it out. Now you can't do that because if you wait that long, your your product's a moot point. Sure. <laughs> so the, the competition already leapfrogged you and and, and took you out. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with moving an entire company. The entire company has to stay light enough, nimble enough, aware enough to handle a self-imposed change yeah. internally, self-imposed crisis, deal with it, struggle through it, get through it, and achieve what the new normal is going to be on the new trajectory and be able to react and see what's happening externally and then project where you need to be and, again, correct yourself, change your strategy, and do all those other things you would have done internally on your own. So it doesn't have to be a pandemic. It could just be the guy across the street's got a better restaurant now. Sure. We understand the frustrations HOA board members and property managers face when deciding the best solution for their HOA and pool security. Should we use a keypad? hand out keys, or install a key card system? Do we even need cameras? These are some of the questions that are difficult to navigate, and we're here to help. At LockDock Security, we've spent over 20 years working with homeowners associations and property managers to find a system that best fits the pool and HOA needs. Camera systems for the front gate or front entrance, key card systems for the pool gates, or simply updating the gate so that it meets safety and code compliance. We like to take the guesswork out of the process to answer any questions and help find the right solution. Our mission is to help you protect your people and your property, and that includes pools. Contact our team today to schedule your free consultation for your community. All right, I want to jump back to this. Okay, you, you said something that's pretty intriguing to me. People see this this new directive one of three ways so you come in with whatever hey this is this is what we see as an issue or this is what we see as a potential opportunity and this is what we want to go after people see it one of three ways you just said a challenge all right you're 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 challenging me let's see if i can do this they're neutral they are like this i'm not really going to change anything i it, it is what it is type thing adapting to it and then the third is the concern about how this impacts me um from from the perspective of leading in chaos and understanding that i think the people that take it as a challenge that's awesome right that's that's a that, that's an ally for you because they're going to be able to just go and and make stuff happen the neutral people are ones that uh you're probably going to have maybe some opportunity to motivate the ones that are concerned about how this impacts me let's break that down and kind of talk through that because i think that is something from a leadership standpoint that could definitely throw people off so the context of my answer was you have your leaders, your managers in a room when you tell them mm -hmm. what you tell them. Below them, almost universally, it's the employees, the technical experts, they all fall in that third category of concern that change is going to adversely impact their world. Mm -hmm. The problem is if you have your leadership group who's supposed to convey the new strategy as a challenge, as something that's achievable, put a positive, you know, um, spin to the whole thing. You've only got one third that are going to do that as they're sitting in the room facing you. Mm -hmm. So two thirds are either going to not give it any energy 
or actually convey that this is really terrible. Yeah. <laughs> this is not going to, this isn't going to go well. So what I found is you have to understand that's human nature. That's just, you know, people don't like change. You have to figure out kind of the why first, mm -hmm. and you have to convey that. that. That reduces, maybe you can get the neutrals to shift over in the very first sitting if the neutrals are only neutral because they like to assess and analyze things intellectually before they commit emotionally, which is what I've found. Mm -hmm. So if they understand the why, it could be a negative why. It could be if we don't do this the next six months, we're going under, and it could be a positive why. You know, if we do this, everybody in this room is going to end up getting a bonus of X, and we're going to be off to the races for the next five years unimpeded by anybody in competition with us. And that might, might be enough to con convince them. It's that third group that no matter what you say, no matter how you say it, no matter how you tee it up, even if you said you're going to get a $500,000 bonus if we get to the other end of this, you know, manager number four, mm -hmm. they're still emotionally going to react internally. And then after the fact, maybe even worse than, than what they're showing you in body language, uh, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to act and react like this is just not good for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, even to an extreme where they're wondering where they should go next. Mm -hmm. Sure. They start thinking, you know, exit plans. Mm -hmm. So if you know these people and you know that that's the way they're going to react to these things, it's easier because you can pull them in one-on-one -on -one, either before you tell the others or right after you've told the others. And you need to do a little bit of personal leadership, you know, the charisma, the, the, uh, the, the ability to sell them on the concept, the outcomes, the end state, the why, one-on-one, -on -one. And, then, and then invite them to, to lay out all their challenges, all their things that they're concerned about. What are you afraid of? Why are, why are you worried? You know, Because they may have some legitimate ones. They may have some ones that you hadn't considered. Or maybe at this point, you haven't even said how we're going to do this. Sure. Now what I want you to do is I'm commissioning you guys to come up with what are all the challenges and all the... Uh, you know, what are all the things we're going to have to do to make this happen? But you, you get them to a point where they're actually telling you all their concerns. And then you keep trying to move them to at least neutral. Now, from a pragmatic standpoint, you also want to realize that if you can create a, an advocate or a, you know, czar is probably the wrong word, but kind of a cheerleader within the organization mm -hmm. that is put in charge of the project of whatever the new is, then you can basically enlist some people from the optimistic challenges are good side of the equation and have them be the ones that are communicating and conveying with the rest of the company, holding town halls, divisional departmental meetings, you know, Zoom meetings, whatever, um, inviting questions, answering the questions optimistically and, and pragmatically and inviting more input. Because if you don't do that, you're just hoping when everybody finally walks out of the room, either the first time or after the one-on-one -on -one sessions, that they're just all going to do what you hope that they'll do. And, and hope's not a good strategy. So that's something else I would do in that scenario. I deputize, you know, like in a town, you, dep you deputize, deputize the people that are willing to fight for law and order, not the ones that are, that are going to leave. Sure. <laughs> I, leave I, town. I, I like the, uh, I like that, that concept. And I was, I've, uh, I've been going through a book here recently called measure what matters. And I, that's one of the things that they talked about. I, I believe they called it a, a uh, OKR cheerleader, but I can't, that may be incorrect, but uh, you just said that and it kind of struck that term. But um, from, a, from a perspective of, hey, here's, here's somebody that's really going to own this and carry it out and, and keep people engaged and, um, and, and inspired with it rather than it being a, uh, just kind of a, another thing that we have to try to attack, but really creating some engagement around, uh, around the, the process. So if you have those types of folks on your team, some ways to, to kind of work through that, get to the why, um, understand that they've got to commit emotionally before they're going to in commit in intellectually, um, and maybe off offer them a, a presentation on a kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis to let them air out their concerns that they may not air out in a group setting. Correct. All those things. And it's one thing that you learn going through the first part of the basic SEAL course uh, that has all these scary kind of movie movie worthy events like hell week, et cetera, is you need to gravitate towards the people that have an optimistic, upbeat view, even when things are really bad. Mm -hmm. They tend to be the same way when things aren't really bad, but they're, it's funny. They, they actually get activated 
when things are bad, when things, when you're in, in harsh mm -hmm. conditions and SEAL trainings that way, there are people that will gravitate towards people that see everything as bad. Everything is terrible. Everything's harsh. And having watched as an instructor, a SEAL instructor, seeing the gravitation of these, these populations, you start off with like 120 students and see they start to gravitate to people that they see as, as either emotional allies, positive or negative. And by the second or third week, they've all kind of broke into their little groups and cliques. And anybody associated with the negative approach, you know that pretty much all, if not, you know, most of them are going to be gone mm. in the first six or seven weeks of the course. They're going to quit. They're going to be convinced to quit. There'll be no reason not to quit because there'll be, and there'll be a lot of intellectual arguments that they should quit by other people that they're hanging out with. So it's kind of like if you're not a flat earther, but you hang out all day long for weeks and weeks with flat earthers, you're suddenly a flat earther. Mm. And, uh, and human beings are that way. They want to mm. gravitate towards somebody that makes them feel like the world makes sense. The exact opposite, if you see somebody that's that's laughing when things are really bad, that are that are trying to help the, the person next to them that's faltering, mm. that's that's really high positive energy. And I've seen that outside of the outside of the military. I've seen that in all walks of life. I've seen it in business. And those people are what they would call in the military a force multiplier. You could take one super positive person and stick them in the middle of 30 kind of neutral to negative people. Leave them there for a couple of weeks, and you you completely flip the flip the scales to the positive side. Both positive and negative influence are both effective, and you have to you have to lead and manage that, especially when you're, you're involved in in making changes or reacting to the dynamics of external change. Valuable advice. Um, I, I very very valuable advice. Uh, years ago, uh, we had several folks in our organization that I'd learned over time when we would make presentations in front of a group setting. If they had reservations about it, they would publicly challenge it. And so, for you just said, you've got a uh, force multiplier in either way. Um, so, what I learned through that process was those particular people. I would bring them as you just kind of laid out here. Present it to them one on one. Hey, here's here's what we we want to try to accomplish. Let me know what what things we're missing. Tell me what's what we're missing about it, and go through that process. And because they heard it and they were able to air their challenges, then they afterwards they could we could adjust or modify and make sure that the plan was applicable. And then they were some of the biggest allies for that. They were the biggest advocates for that because they they understood it and they believed in it. Um, so it's very very uh, valuable advice on um, on that side of things. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about three thousand four hundred twenty two times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDock.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDock Security, helping you protect your people and your property. Something that we, you mentioned before we got started was about staying intellectually humble uh, when it comes to... Uh, managing through chaos or leading through chaos or uh, leading through disruption. Walk me through that process. What, is, what, is, what does that mean from your, your perspective? Um, intellectual humility to me, and the way I spell it out in the book, is basically waking up every day and reinventing yourself psychologically, professionally, in a way that you leave behind all the accolades and you leave behind all the the failures and kind of think and, and look at the world fresh and anew because all of that baggage that you carry along, whether it's all good stuff or bad stuff, it's going to affect the way you absorb new information and the way you interact with people bringing you new information from maybe some, from some odd sources. And so you're going to start shutting down the channels of insight. Mm -hmm. You're going to become less creative, less capable of handling what's really happening in front of you. And you've, you've did it to yourself. So, for example, you go to college and you went to college 10 years ago. Who cares? 
whatever that curriculum was, I don't care what, mm-hmm. what line of professional, uh, profession you're in, probably 60% of the material you were taught is, is irrelevant today Sure, because of advances of, of all kinds, not just technical. If you were answering questions in a meeting about something and you were using, you know, a book, you know, the, the C, the C uh, book out of a 1974 uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you'd be perceived as an idiot. Why would you do that? But, you know, in 1974, that was the sum total of all the world's information. Yeah. It was absolutely accurate, and you would look like a really smart person to, to use as a reference. Mm. So we, we constantly go back into our, our past and try to pull out something that matches up with what we think we just heard, whether it's a, a problem to be solved or a piece of information. So what you end up doing is you should let your past help groom your judgment, mm-hmm. your ability to judge and assess, but you shouldn't take it and use it as a template for problem solving, and you shouldn't use it as a way to filter out information, sources of information, ideas, be just because the, you tried them and they didn't work, or you read about them and they didn't work, or you read about them and they did work. Mm. You need to just clear your mind. And the humility part is basically if if you're – doing a great job and you, you just got a raise, you got promoted and you know, you've had, you're on a run. You tend to think that everything coming out of your head and everything coming out of your mouth is genius. Mm-hmm. And it's not, you're just, you're just waiting for that bear trap. There's something out there that's not designed for Marty Strong's last five years. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's something different. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to step right into there. I'm going to charge right into there because I know I, I got, I've got my act together I haven't failed in five years, and I'm going to fail dramatically. It happens a lot in military history, and sometimes in, in the history of politics of different nations, you'll see that. You know, that rear view mirror, that rear view mirror thinking, that that applying and rolling forward constantly what you learned in the past and mm-hmm. say that's just the way it's going to be in the in the future, it, it doesn't work. So that's, that's the – generally, that's the concept of intellectual humility. I, I, I want to kind of – break that down a little bit because I you gave a lot of examples there one real example and this this is a personal example for me years and years and years ago I had um, I guess a, a boss or a, a direct leader that anytime I brought up an idea it was oh well, we tried that 10 years ago and it didn't work and it was just an immediate shutdown because we tried it 10 years ago and it didn't work never really a this is why it didn't work, this is what we learned from it, or maybe if we tried it again, these were the adjustments that we needed to make. It was just a, nope, tried it 10 years ago, it didn't, it didn't work. And I, if, I'm, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, that's the attitude that you definitely don't want to take uh, from a leadership perspective because you're at, at a point, you're missing a lot of things. You're, you're using that old data from the, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mixing the two things together is what I'm intrigued by because I think this is something that uh, as a leader I need to work on a lot of times is you enter into a conversation, you enter into a situation, and maybe it's not a shutdown of, hey, we tried that 10 years ago and it didn't work, but processing things so fast or or over the top so quickly that you are failing to actually listen to what is being said and what are the things that I'm missing. Um, so the reason I'm bringing all that up is what is the the balance between intellectual humility and leveraging experiential data? Because those two things, I'm, I'm wrestling with them in my head. Experiential data, and I think that's kind of what you're talking about, letting your past kind of groom your judgment. But oftentimes we overshadow experiential data and then come across intellectually arrogant. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's a, a perfect answer. I think, you know, I, I tend to think about leadership as my my subject matter. Mm-hmm. Leading is not the same as managing. I think managing, you have to know a lot of technical information. You're, you're basically responsible for existing systems, processes, people, procedures, et cetera. Where leadership kicks in and management kind of stops is when those underlying and supporting systems processes and people fail or fail dramatically, usually in the face of some kind of a challenge. And it doesn't have to be as dramatic as an airplane crashing for a leader to 
to be required. But hmm. you can't manage your way out of a system and people failure scenario. You have to step back and and that's the time where you rethink what you've been doing. Rethink if that's even the system you want going forward. Is that the, are those the people that you want going forward? That's different than managing. That takes insight. That takes the ability to look forward, mm-hmm. to, to model out different outcomes. And if you were not going to kind of drop the baggage at your feet of what your past experiences were, you wouldn't get anywhere other than just doing what you had before, just replacing the people and just fixing the system and move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in in the military context, when I was a leader, the judgment that was built up over time was based on a failure of information that was given to me actually turning out to be true on the target. So you, you train, you prepare, everybody tells you, what the target's going to be like. They give you a history lesson. They give you a cultural lesson. They tell you about how many bad guys, what they're armed with, what they're going to probably do if you show up, what they're probably going to do if they don't know you're there. You know, do the doors open in or do they open out? A massive amount of technical information about what is. Mm-hmm. And 90% of the time on a special operations mission, you show up and it's not like that at all. So if you were to execute based on what everybody spent, you know, a million dollars preparing you to, to uh, deal with, Mm -hmm. you'd fail. And so what you end up doing is you take all that into account. It it helps as a backdrop, but you go there and you look at the situation fresh and you absorb the reality. Mm. There's not, there's not five people. There's a hundred people. There's not, you know, two pickup trucks with a, with a machine gun in the back. There's a light armored vehicle with a 20 millimeter gun on the top. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's dogs. Nobody said anything about dogs. You know, there's, so what you do is you reassess and then you either abort the mission because you have that authority and it's not important enough to get people killed, or you have to come up with a new plan right there based on what you can see with your own eyes here with your own ears. Mm -hmm. And at that, in, in, in that point, you're tossing away a lot, if not most of what you were told. And I've had I've had weather reports, I've had maps, I've had all, I mean, things that you would just say, okay, well, this has got to be right. I mean, it's only a weather report that's only four hours in advance of me being in there, Mm -hmm. and it's wrong. Title information, wrong by 12 feet of title change. I mean, that that messes up your day when you're you're paddling in a boat and you end up on on sand because the tide went out Mm. and it was a 12-foot drop. So that... That was part of me realizing that I could still maintain my my experience and have it, in fact, have it affect my judgment, my quality of my judgment when I was actually in the moment of having to lead. So if you think of it that in a mm. metaphor of business, you've got tons of information feeding, being fed to you all day long as a leader. You're, you're, you're on top of it. It's going along. All of a sudden, something happens. Either an opportunity pops up or some kind of a, a threat pops up. And you could just sit there and say, well, I already know everything I need to know because I've got all this information I've been getting every day. Or you could say, I'm going to clear the slate, open up my mind, and I'm going to look at this with a fresh with a fresh point of view. And I'm going to ask people that maybe didn't feed the information before, mm. you know, tangential experts, people that, that I wouldn't normally talk to. What do you think's happening? Why do you think it's happening? How do you think we should deal with it? And then you make a judgment. Yeah. No, it's it's valuable. I, I I and even on that point, right? I think that's a good way to kind of close out this conversation. Understanding the difference between management and leadership. Understanding when it, when a, when a process is not working and what to do at that point. Stepping back and you know, effectively asking that the question is is the way I'm hearing you say it is what am I missing? Um, and and kind of starting fresh. What do we know to be true? What do we know to be uh, not true? And then what am I missing here? And, and getting that information from the team that's that's actually uh, living and breathing it every day. That's, that's very, very valuable advice. Yeah, I think so. And, and I mean, it's hyper accelerated in combat. It's still the same process. It's still, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Dump, look, listen, Make a decision, go. In business nowadays, it it's not that quick, and it's usually not life and death, but it's still pretty darn quick. It it could be 
you know, you have three or four days to think it through, make a, a decision on a new course of action. That's going to take a month to two months to implement the new course of action and six months to be on a new track. Sure. So, you know, the, but the judgment decision process in the beginning is usually for a leader is still pretty quick these days. Very good advice. Marty, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we've covered a, a, a plethora of topics, and um, obviously you've got some uh, a book to, to check out that I would definitely recommend uh, looking into. You can find out more uh, at martystrongbenimble.com, and we will link that in the description below. And I'm uh, pretty excited to, uh, to learn more about this and uh, maybe chat with you again in the future. Marty, thanks again for joining us today. It was a blast. Uh, man, tons of information, tons of notes here, uh, things that we can actually implement in uh, in our business, and uh, appreciate the challenges that you've offered up today in ways that I can try to work on being a better leader as well. Those of you that are listening or watching for the first time, we invite you to subscribe. We have been doing this for over three years. We've got tons of episodes uh, for you to check out with similar type topics. You can find out more by visiting lockdoc.net slash podcast, and make sure you subscribe because we have a brand new episode coming out next Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.